are an example of a price ceiling. So, if we have an ordinary supply and demand curve, and price is already right here, okay, and we want to set a maximum ceiling on price, where should we put the price control on this graph? We want a ceiling, above, an, above upper limit, limit. an upper limit, an upper limit. Above the <laughs> Okay, that's a maximum that we want the price to be able to hit. Hmm, is that ceiling going to do us any good? Equilibrium's already here. No. Right here. Does it do us any good to have that ceiling up there no. to keep no. equilibrium from hitting it? Uh -huh. Sorry. This is super routine. Someone threw these that. I actually hurt my shoulder. You threw an expo marker. <laughs> 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 I threw it stupid. So, where perhaps should we instead consider putting our ceiling to limit prices? At equilibrium. But the price is already at equilibrium. We're trying to set a maximum price. We don't like where equilibrium is. We want a maximum price set elsewhere. It has to go below equilibrium to actually be effective. Equilibrium is already right here. The price is already right here. If I want to limit that price, I want to set a maximum price, I want that price to be a ceiling below it so that the equilibrium can't hit. So would that shift the graph? It doesn't shift the graph. What it does is create a shortage. I can tell who read. Okay. So price ceilings, it's counterintuitive, right? Because we stand on the floor and the ceiling's above our head. And you consider yourself to live in equilibrium. Okay? Everybody looks at these graphs the same way. But in this instance, you want the ceiling below equilibrium. So that it limits price, it controls prices, keeps them from getting to equilibrium. Okay? So then a price floor goes above equilibrium and creates a surplus. Yay, yay. Thank you. 
room for reading. When you guys read and understand, we're able to go so much more quickly. Yes, Gavin? Is the price ceiling above budget? Well, if I put a price ceiling in and I put above equilibrium, it's still a price ceiling, but it's utterly ineffective. Okay, taxes are an additional um, cost placed on either the buyers or sellers of each unit of a good or service. That tax goes to the government. We're going to look at the actual graphs. There's a lot of graphing in this chapter to look at how these price controls and taxes affect the market, how they impact sellers, how they impact buyers, how they impact government revenue. All right, so apartments. We don't have rent controls here in Omaha because we have plenty of housing. But let's say New York City, where housing is relatively scarce and incredibly expensive at market equilibrium. The average price per square foot in New York City is un unreal. <coughs> so on this curve, or on this chart, graph price is the rental price of apartments, quantity is the quantity of apartments available. Okay. People need places to live. Businesses are willing to provide those places to live. So let's just say that the equilibrium price for apartments, and this is just generic apartments, we're not talking one bedroom, two bedroom, we're not getting into features, apartment, $800, okay? The government says not enough people can afford $800. Now we know that that's not right because exactly the right amount of people can afford $800 or equilibrium wouldn't be there, correct? We know that they're wrong. So they put a price ceiling in at $1,000. Prices can't go over $1,000. We know that that's stupid, right? Because prices aren't going over $1,000 because the equilibrium is at 800. So this is called a non-binding price ceiling, meaning it has no impact. It affects no one. Now, if I renovate my basement apartment in the house that I own and want to rent it for $1,200 a month because there's a jacuzzi in every bathroom, it's got three bathrooms, only two bedrooms, there's a jacuzzi, um, heated floors, marble countertops, a live-in chef, right? If I want to rent that apartment for $1,200, can I? No, because there's a price ceiling. Would I really be able to rent that apartment for $1,200? Probably not anyway. I'm a dream it because market equilibrium is $800. Okay. I overinvested in that basement apartment. And frankly, I'm going to move down there because it's nicer than where I live. I was going to say, I would move down there. <laughs> okay. So we put a price ceiling in below the equilibrium. This is now a binding price ceiling. But at this price, as you have correctly said earlier, we end up with my, oh, I just died. <laughs> we end up with a shortage of how many apartments? 150 people are now homeless because of this price control. How do we know they're now homeless? They're not. There's not 150 people homeless. How many people are homeless? There used to be this many people renting apartments. Now how many people are renting apartments? This many. So how many people are homeless? These people 
are now homeless. They're the ones directly impacted by this change. Do you see? All of these people are not homeless because these people didn't have an apartment before anyway. Follow? Okay. You will see practice questions that will want to mislead you down that path. By the way, um, another couple hours and I should be done with the unit test. So potentially in your hands tomorrow, which is a good thing because then that'll keep this quiz from falling on a Monday. All right. No, it's not Friday because we took yesterday. I have to change the lesson plans. Um, so when supply and demand in the long run become more elastic, remember they were more vertical in that last slide? Want to watch the change? Watch the change. More vertical. In the long run, people adjust. Supply and demand become more elastic. And look, the shortage got bigger in the long run. This is bad. This is bad. Because all of those people still need a place to live. Okay. So we still have some outstanding questions here, don't we? Why is there a price ceiling in place in the first place? Okay. Where do these people live? Because now we've got this price ceiling and a shortage. What is society doing here? So with the shortage, sellers have to ration the goods. In that long run scenario, we have 450 people wanting an apartment at $500 and only 150 apartments available. So there are some basic rationing methods you can use. Line up and wait. Or I can just discriminate according to my biases. I don't like people with blonde hair, so I'm just not going to rent any of my apartments to them. I don't like people who cook with garlic. It makes my building stink, so I'm not going to rent any of my apartments to them. Cats creep me out, so no cat people in my apartments, just according to my personal biases. Are these the biases people would ordinarily discriminate based upon? No. And so that's why we have laws prohibiting such discriminations. Race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, etc. Right? Okay. What's the problem with rationing by long lines? Let's say that Austin, our single father here, um, needs a $500 apartment. It's all he can afford on his single income. Um, I assume he has multiple literary children since he's taking more than one class. He needs a shelf in an apartment on which to house them. Um, he can only afford that $500 rent. But if he has to go and line up to try and rent an apartment, what's he going to do? He's going to miss work. He's not going to make the money. He's going to lose his job. Um, yeah, he's going to have naked books running around the shelves all over the place. They're going to be dropping print in every corner of the house. It's terrible. Okay. All right. The problem is, with long lines, it's inefficient. And it's unfair. Let's think about the Thanksgiving sales. We're approaching that season where you're going to start seeing Black Friday sales, right? Best Buy will sell you... Um, a 90-inch plasma screen TV. No, this thing actually exists for the private consumer market. 90-inch plasma screen TV for $99 for the first one customer in every Best Buy store. And then the next two people in get a 72-inch TV, right? Those kinds of deals. So what do people do? They start camping out in front of Best Buy on the 1st of November, which is really odd. If you have that kind of time and that kind of money, why can't you just buy the TV at the regular price, right? Um, it's really unfair because the people who would probably benefit most from those deals are the ones who are least able to take a month off of work and go sleep in a tent on the concrete in front of a store. 
Do you not do that? I don't, actually, because I enjoy warm food and a shower, and not, um, I don't like to. Or um, not eating CDs? Mm. I didn't, don't enjoy doing yes, my business in the either. So but I that's why you take your kids out. That's uh, well. Because that's why I put my kids. That's why I chained my kids to the fence in front of the Best Buy to hold my place in line. <laughs> Shoot, Gavin! I knew there was a reason I should have had kids. Are you available? Can I adopt you? I'm our, I get a list every year. A list? Yeah. What you have to go stand in line for? Good. Not a bad deal. Oh, yeah. Now, I'd be like, this is like, this is like. Now, when we don't control the prices, goods are rationed most efficiently. The people who want them and are willing to pay the price get them. Make sense? That's efficient. Price controls destroy efficiency. We can all agree on that? Is that because we're more worried about equality? Mm hmm. Ostensibly is a good word for that. We say we're more concerned about equality. Are there other ways to achieve equality beyond price controls? Far more efficient ways to achieve equality beyond price controls. Why do we do these? Let's talk about you, unskilled workers. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Anybody can get a job at McDonald's because they will teach you to flip a burger. You don't even have to do math to work at McDonald's, right? Now they have the change machine which spits the coinage out because McDonald's was losing billions of dollars a year from cashiers who were unable to properly count value. Seriously? With a B? With a B. Unable to properly count back change. If they could find a way to have an ATM money dispenser for the paper bills, I'm sure that they would. Because imagine somebody you're giving you need. Yeah. You, you do not have to speak English to work as a cashier at McDonald's. How many of you have seen the cash register input surface? He's all pictures. And there is probably Hannah the next step in this evolution. She said, Why do you even need humans? Why can't I walk up and push the buttons for what I want? Feed my money in and get it back. There are a lot of restaurants in New York City that are getting that way. They're not going out of business. But here's why my unskilled laborers. Who have no prior work experience? Oh, 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 just like C's there. You went back like eight slides. Here's how people who have no prior work experience end up with terrible jobs and poor pay. Now we don't have P and Q here. We have W and L, the wage and the labor. So P is the wage you're paid, the price of the labor, and Q is the quantity of labor being sold or demanded. Now in this instance, folks, remember you are not in the shoes of the consumer, you are the supplier. It is your labor you are selling. Okay? You are the supplier. Wait, what is L stand for? Labor? Quantity, quantity of workers. Alright, so here's the demand for unskilled workers. There's the supply of unskilled workers. We have an equilibrium wage without price controls. By the way, what is our nine. price controlled wage right now for nine dollars for minimum wage workers? Nine dollars for minimum wage workers. Okay. So we have established a price floor, which obviously goes above the equilibrium. What is this $5 price floor going to be called? Non-binding. Non okay. It's worthless. So in this example, we have a seven and a quarter price floor. That was the minimum wage. 
when this book was published. Okay. At that price, what do we end up with? A surplus. There are a lot more unskilled workers willing to work for seven and a quarter an hour than there were for six an hour. Okay? There's our surplus. It is binding because it falls above the equilibrium and is a floor. Okay. All right. Theoretically, at that price, that is, we have created unemployment. A surplus of labor is a bunch of people who are willing and able to work, but who are not employed. They are not employed because there is not enough quantity of demand. Quantity demanded at that price. Okay. Minimum wage laws don't affect highly skilled workers. For our example, I am a highly skilled worker. Can I handle the McDonald's job? Yeah, but I am qualified for jobs that require more training, more education, more specialized skills, correct? We have two ash trees in our backyard that are going to have to be cut down because I'm not going to pay hundreds of dollars a year in perpetuity to try to protect them from the emerald ash borer. Am I able to operate a chainsaw? Yes. Have I felled trees previously? Yes. When I was younger and healthier and more able to climb a ladder and balance. Since my concussion, I've lost some of those skills. I don't feel safe at the top of the 24-foot extension ladder with the chainsaw over my head any longer. And t yes, it is. And T-Hope is afraid of heights. And while he was up there, <laughs> I can still see While he would get up there, and while he does clean out the gutters on our two-story home, um, it's not always comfortable for him, and we're going to have to hire someone. Now, am I going to hire one of you yes. to come and fell my trees? You can mow your lawn, too. <laughs> Possibly, but they're 125 to 150 feet tall. And one of them is relatively close to the house and leaning in the house's direction. So I'm probably going to need a skilled arborist. Arborist? That's his job? Yes. Now, were you guys of the requisite, requisite age, and if you had a car, could you drive for Uber? Yeah. yeah. Theoretically, because you passed the background check, and able to operate a car and keep it insured is the requirement. Unskilled labor. Okay. Um, while Jared has a business doing so, how many of you are also able to operate a lawnmower? <laughs> and a weed whacker? And could theoretically trim my lawn without cutting down the flowers. Could even theoretically bring it on. Yeah. Okay. It's so easy. How many of you believe that you are currently employed as a skilled laborer? Yeah, what do you do? Okay, Davis. Mm, unfortunately, no. Child care workers are not considered skilled labor because you can. Quite literally, train a chimpanzee to change a diaper. But don't you have to have certain requirements like CPR and stuff, though? If you get certified in that area? I if you get certified, but does every worker at a child care facility have to be CPR? No, but if I went to the daycare with CPR and first aid, would I be a skilled worker? No. I'm still going to pay more money. Gio, what do you think you do that is skilled? No. How many of you, I asked, how many of you oh, think you okay, have well, a skilled I'm, I'm job? Between. What, what is your job? So I like Okay, now, Q, Q is to a certain extent partially correct. <laughs> I hate drywall. I, I did our bathroom. I can do that. However, were I more skilled at it, it would not have taken me so long to finish the job and would have looked a little better when I was done. You can do some jobs as an unskilled worker, but you will not earn the wage that a skilled worker would earn. Because if you hang drywall and leave gaps between the sheets, if you sink the screw too deep and create divots in the drywall that require more mud and more taping, etc., etc., for those of you who've never done drywall, you have no clue what I'm talking about. You create a lot of work for the people who come behind. And so they're not going to increase your wage. But the better you get at it, 
the more they're going to pay you because you save time for the even more expensive workers who come along behind you. Okay? I can sweat a pipe. I can do some basic plumbing stuff. But I do not earn the wages of a master plumber. Because the work that I do does not look as good and occasionally requires a re-sweat because it leaks. Sweat. It's called sweating pipe on you. Sorry. I'm going to need a <laughs> That's why I know how to do this stuff. That and I was my father's only son, but separate story. Wait, wait a second. He had two daughters, and my sister learned to cook and do all the house okay, and stuff. And I learned how to build a fence and live a house and That's lit. build a deck. I wish I knew how to do that. I don't know how to change car tires. Okay. <laughs> so, have we established the difference between skilled and unskilled? Yes. Yes. Skills can be acquired through experience or through education or through specialized training. Generally, our teen population lacks skills. Absolutely. I'm not saying you're not good at anything, but you lack employment skills. Okay. Who else falls into unskilled labor category? Old people. Oh, bull. <laughs> Uh, special case. Case. Special category. We're not getting Uneducated. People who lack education. But what if they do not get college? But possibly immigrants. Okay. Guys, every time we increase the minimum wage, we make it harder for you guys to get a job. Why? Because, because I'm willing, as an employer, to hire a kid to sit at the front desk of my business and answer the phone and take messages and sweep a little bit. Why are you at, making my job sound so you At six an hour. At six an hour. But when it's now going to cost me seven and a quarter an hour, instead of hiring two people so the person who's there can take a potty break when they need, now, I can't support that additional cost. I'm only going to hire one. <laughs> so now, somebody who could have worked that job is now going to go unemployed. Thank you. All right. Do you see how that works? So they just don't want to hire you. Yeah, I'm not going to hire that many workers now that they're more expensive for them. They'll have to figure it out, or I'll work, I'll have my business open a few hours, or I'll work four hours, or I'll install a change machine or an automated kiosk. Guys, how many of you have been to the shopping, uh, to, to the shopping store? How many of you have been to the grocery store and ever gone through the self-checkout? Freaking love that thing. Yeah. So, awesome. so, so I'm thinking, I'm envisioning the Walmart over here, and there's six or there are eight auto-checkouts. Manned by one person. Sometimes one person. Look at all that money being saved at the minimum wage. Wow, we Honestly. Those did not come into being out of convenience for the consumer. They came into being out of profit margin for the employer. So why do they still have like the four checkout lines plus like the eight on one side? Because your grandma doesn't like to scan her own groceries. And, because if you have, like, and if I've got two kids in tow, I'm not scanning my own groceries and bagging them and uh, right. keeping Buster and first. Bridget from beating each other up. Oh, and even well, why? Maybe you should be more important. I used to work in child care. How many of those 24 are ever actually open? Only Christmas time. Yeah. So it's like, is that why, is that why they don't, like, they like, never have like they don't want to hire people. Yeah, they don't want to pay you to stand there and wait for a customer to come by. Yeah, that's that's also why they hire more during the night. Welcome to the I'm like, what about Uber? Alright, well, I'm here. We're not getting into that now. Alright, practice time. Alright, a $90 ceiling is put in place on this market. $90 ceiling. Where does the ceiling go? 
Here is our $90 price ceiling. What, pray tell, is the quantity demanded at that price ceiling? Is it this one? No. Okay, so the quantity demanded is 120 at this price ceiling, and the quantity supplied is? What do we end up with? Of? What about our ninety dollar price floor? Where's it go? A ninety dollar price floor goes where? There. Who's impacted? $120 price floor. I do need a longer stick. All right. We got an issue here. We put in a $120 price floor. There's a lot of hotel rooms. Sitting empty, aren't there? Ouch. Half of those hotel rooms are sitting empty. All right. So here's our price ceiling. Shortage of 30. We're right. There's our price floor. Now our price floor. Oh shoot, I forgot to get the box of doom ready. Let's do it tomorrow. Oh, right now, right now, right now. Right now. How did you keep it? I don't ever ready ever again until it sucks. Drop the class and she'll forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can we just start throwing ideas on? Yeah. Honestly, I think maybe we should come up with them. Okay. <laughs> I shall not forget. <laughs> All right. Markets are a good way to organize economic activity. Because he spoke. <laughs> oh yes, they were both complicit in the activity. <laughs> All right. So prices. How many box games have you handed out in the last couple years? In the last couple years, very few. Not a legend. Not last year. Not one. Which is why it's not even ready to go. Yeah. It's not to be Misbehave in a way that merits actual punishment instead of a snide remark and a glare from me. It wasn't that bad. It was a broadcast Whatever. And we're not doing what they were supposed to be doing when a sub is here when you should be in even better behavior. You were not reading if you were over here rummaging around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So, price controls interfere with the market because prices signal to the suppliers. As prices go up, people, suppliers understand that their incentives are increased. As prices go down, suppliers understand they may be overproducing, right? When we put price controls in place, those signals are no longer there to indicate to the market what it should be doing. So imagine you're driving and Google Maps or Siri is giving you directions to get where you're going. She's good. You're on your way to an important job interview and all of a sudden Siri or Google Maps stops working. The signal is interrupted. You have a much harder time reaching the proper destination. When we put price controls in place, we interrupt those signals, and the market doesn't get where it's supposed to be. We interfere with it. It's like listening to AM radio and driving through a tunnel. The signals don't get through. AM radio is an antique means of communication used in the olden days. Q. I'm not seeing anything pros to this seeing 
Yeah, I really don't. The ceiling business. Especially this one. We very often put ceilings in place to help the poor, those people who can't afford the $800 a month apartment. Say, so we'll put the price controls in place. We'll get them a $500 a month apartment. They can afford that. But what do we do? We leave half of the people who could afford a $500 a month apartment waiting in line and homeless. And then they and turn the into, and, and then those apartments turn And the quality space. goes down, too. So those $500 apartments that should have been $800 apartments, the landlord has less incentive to maintain them. And they very quickly become roach motels and nasty, nasty places. Okay, somebody's going to talk to somebody. We're going to come back to this, too. We're going to come back to this. All right, let's start with taxes. We are the future. You are the future. No problem. Okay. Oh, I know. Why do we have taxes? We have taxes because there are things which we as a society cannot individually afford to provide for ourselves, which we must rely upon another entity to provide through collective payment. For instance, I cannot put up a missile shield over my house and my place of work and my car as I'm driving around. I need everybody to help pay for our national defense. I cannot personally bet all of the other 150 people on the airliner that I take to my vacation destination. I need everybody who travels every day to pay a surcharge on their ticket to pay for the TSA to vet those people and potentially and theoretically make it a safer trip for me, although not you know, enjoyable. Okay. We have to pay for these things collectively. If I want the police to be standing by to come and answer my 911 call when the boogeyman is breaking into my house, I can't wait until that moment to go through the yellow pages and find a private investigator to come and arrest him. I need a trained and equipped force standing by. Fire department works the same way. Okay? So we pay these taxes to support these entities. You could not all collectively afford, or you could not all individually afford to hire me to tutor you for 50 minutes a day on economics. But collectively, your parents pay their taxes and we provide this facility filled with teachers who are willing to instruct you. Follow? Okay. These are called public goods. We'll get into that next or later this semester. Okay. The government can make buyers or sellers pay the tax. You go either way. You can tax a percentage of the price, like sales tax, or you can put a specific dollar amount on each unit sold. The gas tax. Taxes per gallon. Okay, can go either way. We're going to look at per unit taxes only. It's much more simple, much simpler, much simpler to analyze. Uh, but the impact is the same whether it's a percentage tax or a per unit tax. How do you tax the seller? Like every... Put the tax on the sale rather than on the production. Or put the tax on the production rather than on the sale. That's it, Andrew. All right. So, pizza. We should start with pizza tomorrow. Pizza. Maybe we should have a food day.